Good morning, good morning. This is a really fancy setup compared to what I'm used to, so I'm just going to spend a bit of time getting used to this. Um, thank you so much for, for having me this morning. It's an absolute privilege and honour to be here at Calvary Chapel, Maidstone. I've heard a lot about what's going on here from Matt in the times that we've spent together, and I'm very excited to share the word with you today. Um, when considering what to preach on and when praying and seeking the Lord's guidance as to what chapter, what book, what topic, um, God brought me to, I believe, Romans chapter 12. So if you want to turn to Romans chapter 12. And when, when I was praying about this, I was a little bit nervous, to be honest, because it's a bit of a hard-hitting chapter. And I was kind of asking the Lord in prayer, Lord, this is my first time <laughs> at this church in front of these brothers and sisters, and I don't really want to go there with such a challenging message. Um, but, you know, when you're pastoring and preaching, it's the Lord who should be guiding you. And so submission is what has to take place. So we will be looking at Romans chapter 12. And I hope that the Lord will give me love and grace to preach what could be potentially uh, a challenging message, not just for you, but for myself personally, for all of us as believers. Because at the end of the day, the preacher is not exempt to the lessons that he's teaching. But before we start, let's, let's join in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege and honour it is to share your word with these brothers and sisters here today. And I testify, Lord, that it is only by your grace that any man is able to open the scriptures and teach others. And I pray, Lord, for your grace to be with me today as I share this word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that by your power of the Holy Spirit, you would open up hearts and minds to the word today. That it would not fall, Lord, on hard hearts, but soft hearts, moldable hearts, that by your spirit you can form into the image of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please change us all today, Lord. Convict us, encourage us, help us, transform us. All for your glory and for your kingdom, we ask in your precious name. Amen. So turn to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to start by reading from verse 1 to the end of verse 2. Here's what it says. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." The title for today's sermon is quite literally the same title that Paul uses, is Being a Living Sacrifice. It is my belief from the Word of God that every single Christian, every born-again believer, is called to be a living sacrifice unto God. And we're going to talk a great deal today about what that actually looks like. Because it sounds good, it sounds holy, it sounds biblical, but what does it actually look like in your day-to-day -day living? Being a living sacrifice is not something of lip service, but something that is shown through our actions and through the way that we walk in this world, through the way that we behave as Christians. So Paul starts by saying, I appeal to you, therefore. The word appeal there is I urge you, I instruct you. He's talking to all Christians and saying, I urge you to listen to what I'm about to say. And I love what Paul says. He starts off by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God. Paul wants to make something abundantly clear to all the listeners. I do not appeal to you because I'm the apostle and you're the congregation. I do not appeal to you because I've performed miracles. I do not appeal to you because my handkerchief once cast out demons. I appeal to you on one credit and one credit alone, the mercies of God. Paul, throughout this chapter, is going to remind us the only way that you can be a living sacrifice, the only way I can even command you to be one, is all by the mercy and grace that God has afforded us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
The best way I think to explain what this looks like is to take the image in the Old Testament of a bond servant. The Apostle Paul in other letters says, I am a bond servant of Jesus. And a bond servant was a very specific type of servant within the household. And I'm just going to quickly explain what a bond servant is because I believe in the bond servant we see a living sacrifice example. What it would be is you would be a servant in the house and the master would come to you and say, I set you free. I take away any restraint, I take away any contract, any covenant we have, I set you free, you can take what you've earned, you can take some of your belongings, you can leave the house, you're free to build your own life. And the servant would walk outside the house and he would turn around and look at his master's house, look at his master's household, and the servant, despite having no bond, no binding, no compulsion, nothing like this, he would say, out of love for my master, out of love for his household, I, from my own free will, choose to be a servant for the rest of my life. And what they would do is they would take his ear and they would nail it to the doorpost. They would put a nail through his ear onto the doorpost and that would represent from the moment he does that to the moment he dies, I am now a bond servant. I serve this household of my own free will. I give my master everything. Now I want you to notice something. The bond servant's motivation was not one of legalism, but one of love. The bond servant's motivation to remain in the household was for one reason and one reason only, I love my master. I love my Lord. Paul says, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus has set me free. He has freed me from sin, from the yoke of slavery that I was under. He has freed me from Satan's kingdom and the kingdom of this world. And because he has freed me, because he has loved me so much, I now desire to serve him with my everything. I give him all of me. I present myself to him fully. Another example would be in the book of Isaiah when God calls out from his throne, who will, go through, who will go for me? And Isaiah turns around and says, here I am, Lord, I will go. A living sacrifice is a person who is willing to give God everything. Every aspiration, every desire, all the motivation he places back in God's hands and says, you be the Lord of my life. You direct me, my King. You own me. I serve you. That's what a living sacrifice is. And that is what all Christians are called to be. Every single one of us. He says to be a living sacrifice, present your bodies holy and acceptable to God. And I love this because Paul does not leave Jesus Christ out of the equation. The only way any of us can be holy and acceptable to God, as it was rightly said earlier, is through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God removes the filthy garments of our sin and places on us the vestments of Christ, the righteousness of Jesus, that is when we are then made holy and acceptable before him. So I do want to get one thing absolutely abundantly clear before we move through Romans 12, and this is so important and crucial to understand. We are not sacrificial servants or living sacrifices in order to be saved. We are living sacrifices because we have been saved. I do not serve God in order to win his approval. I serve him because I have already been approved through Jesus Christ by him. And that is something very crucial. If I did not mention that, by the time we get to the end of this chapter, you could very well think, oh my goodness, I've got a list of things to do. I've got to try and work my way into heaven. No, just like with the bond servant, a living sacrifice is a reaction to what has already been done for you. 
It's a reaction to the goodness of God. It's a reaction to his love. The Bible says he first loved us. None of us are able to say, I first loved God. He loved us while we were indeed his enemies. Paul now continues in his description of what a living sacrifice looks like in practical terms. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When he says do not be conformed to this world, the word there used in the ancient Greek is do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The pattern that it takes you through. Do not allow the world to invade your mind, your heart, your perspectives, your actions. Don't think like the world, act like the world, behave like the world. Don't react like the world. Do not be conformed to this world and the way and the pattern in which this world is heading. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Notice those three things are the same exact three things that Eve was tempted with in the garden. Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes and pride of life she saw that the fruits looked good she saw that it was good for eating and she saw that it could make her wise and the bible clearly tells us this is not from the father but from the world the world is self-seeking but the sacrificial servant is to be god seeking And I like what Paul says next, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. When your mind was first renewed, when you first believe in Jesus Christ and he first renews your mind and changes your heart and changes your mind, a beautiful thing takes place. But I want to just point something out from what Paul says here. It's not a one-time thing. It's not my mind was renewed and now I can just sit back and relax and it's all good. Paul teaches our minds need to be constantly renewed. Why? Well, you've heard the expression, the mind is a battleground, right? Well, my goodness, does the world wage a war in our minds? Every single day, the world is looking to invade your mind in some way, shape or form. Whether it be from your sinful flesh or whether it be from outward oppression, whatever it is, the mind is constantly under attack. Just to give you a really kind of a silly example, but an example that actually for me was a, a, a big problem I had when I first became a Christian. Before having become a Christian, I had listened to a very certain type of music. And the music I'd loved listening to every single day was truly aggressive, full of curse words, full of violence lyrics. And I I used to listen to it every single day. And when I became a Christian, I kind of thought to myself, it's okay. You know, I've got the spirit in me. I can overcome. I'm I'm not going to allow my mind to wander. It's all good. I've got this under control. And so in the first kind of six months of my Christianity, I still listened to this music. And then I began to notice something that happens. My family around me, my uh, girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, began to notice something that used to happen. I used to listen to this music. And then after about an hour of listening to it, for the next two to three hours, I'd be wound up. I'd have like violent thoughts in my head. I'd be really impatient. I'd be really snappy. I would constantly have to then have my mind renewed afterwards, usually through prayer or the reading of the word. Now that's a small example, but the point I'm trying to make here is don't underestimate the influence of the world over your thoughts and over your mind. And so how is it that we can renew our mind on a daily basis? The Bible teaches us, renew your mind by the word of God. Allow the word of God to permeate your mind, to sink deep into your thoughts. Let that be your focus. Let that be the driving force behind what you're thinking. Let the word of God renew your mind.
It is not enough to eat of spiritual food on a Sunday only. I have no doubt that Matt and Ian prepare great spiritual meals for you on a Sunday, but it is not enough just to eat here. You should be feeding yourselves on the spiritual word of God every single day. Jesus said, man does not eat by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you were to come to me after having not eaten physical food for four weeks and say, Pastor, I feel weak, I feel depressed, I feel ill, I feel like I'm going to faint, what's going on? I might say, have you eaten? No, not for four weeks. What do you think's going on? <laughs> Sometimes as a pastor, I have people come to me and say, Aaron, spiritually, I feel oppressed, I feel depressed, I feel weak, I feel like temptations are everywhere, I feel like I've got no strength. Okay, okay, okay. When was the last time you were in the Word? Uh, last Sunday. That might just be part of the problem, <laughs> is that you are not eating, you're not having your mind renewed every single day. Day. The scriptures are so much more than just a book. The Bible says the scriptures are living, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit. When we have the correct perspective about scripture, then we will truly have a passion to dive into it. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Bible teaches that in order to grow in discernment, we must indeed grow in the understanding of the knowledge of God, grow in the application of the scriptures to our life. The more you know of the word, the more you truly know of God's character, of his purposes, of how he does things, of the order in which he sets in all creation. And the greater your ability through the power of the Holy Spirit and the application in living it out, you are to be able to discern what the will of God is. And I like how it says testing as well. Knocking on the doors to see if they open. Testing every single spirit you hear. You should not listen to me and believe, I, I believe everything's Aaron's saying because Matt's vouched for him and he's a Calvary Chapel pastor. You shouldn't. I like what Chuck... Uh, Misler used to say, he said, don't believe a word Chuck Misler says. He used to start every sermon by saying, don't believe a word Chuck Misler says. Once I'm finished preaching, that's when the work begins. Go to your Bible and see if what I've said is true. After this, you should go to Romans 12 and weigh and test the spirit in which I bring this message and see as to whether the Bible teaches what I'm telling you. Let's carry on in verse 3 to verse 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Paul once again starts, Paul is about to give an exhortation on humility, and look how he starts. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone. Paul is about to encourage the church in being humble, and he starts by saying, it is only by the grace of God that I can even give you this instruction. If you know what grace means, grace means undeserved favour. So Paul says, by the undeserved favour, the favour I don't deserve that has been given to me through Jesus Christ, I say to everyone among you. Once again, notice Paul does not use his position. He doesn't use his apost apostle authority. He says, I can only give you this message by the grace of God. 
The same thing that makes you a Christian, that saved your souls, the grace of God through Jesus Christ, is the same thing that enables me to preach this message to you. This is what Paul is saying. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, and this is a difficult one, right? Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Pride found its way into Lucifer's heart when he was a perfect guardian cherub. More powerful, more knowledgeable and more wise in that particular state than all of us put together. God in Ezekiel literally says about Satan at the time when he was named Lucifer, you were perfect. Perfect in beauty, perfect in wisdom, perfect in power. Now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm fairly sure none of us are perfect. But pride found its way into his heart. Now, if pride can find its way into Lucifer's heart in heaven, please do not think so arrogantly that it cannot find its way into your heart while we are here on earth. Pride is the single most subtle and dangerous sin there is. It is the first sin ever recorded in the scriptures. Pride being found within Satan's heart, even before the fall of Adam and Eve. So Paul says, let no one think more of themselves than they ought to. Let no one think more of themselves than they ought to. First Corinthians, Paul addresses the Corinth church and he says, if anyone thinks he knows something, he does not know as he ought to know. Basically, if you think I'm there, I've got it, I've, I've perfected how to be a Christian, or if you're even drawing close to the comprehension that that's the case, you are probably at the very, very beginning of the start line. In Disciples Church, sometimes I like to go through kind of spiritual ages. You've got the newborn spiritual baby, you've got the child, you've got the older child, the teenager, the young adult, and then the granddad in the faith. And I like to say to people, where are you? Someone might say, well, I think I'm a baby. And another person says, well, I, I think I'm an adult. I always say, wherever you think you are, probably like take yourself back 10, 20 years. That's probably where you actually are. <laughs> Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And I like what Paul says next, but to think with sober, sober judgment. To think with sober judgment. The translation in the Blue Letter Bible, to put a moderate estimate on yourself. To put a moderate estimate on yourself. This is not about getting a whip and kind of, you know, slashing yourself and being like, I'm, I'm just this and I'm that. What it is, is dependence on God for all things. A humility equals a dependence on God. If you think you know, you don't need to ask the Lord. But if you really do understand that everything good comes from God, that all the giftings come from God, that all knowledge comes from God, and you need his help and substance in every single facet of life, it will lead you to humble yourself before God every single day. Help me, Lord, with the smallest to the largest problem that I have. Help me in everything. Humility is absolutely key to being a living sacrifice. People can make sacrifices that are not really sacrifices. They can make what I like to call self-serving sacrifices. Maybe they do it for the attention of men, or maybe they do it in order that they can be looked upon in the good light. Or maybe they do it for gain or position or for wealth or for whatever reason. These are self-serving sacrifices. These are not real sacrifices. Humility is key to being a living sacrifice before God. And he goes on, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. 
Notice, please, with me, it says that God has assigned the different measures of faith given to different Christians. Now, once again, let's just clear this up. This is not a sign of partiality. This is not, I love you more and therefore I will give you greater faith. All of it is to do with God's purposes and God's plan in the individual lives of believers. In Luke 12, 48, Jesus teaches, everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. And to him who they entrusted much, much will be demanded of him. So if God gives someone a great faith or maybe a big ministry and, and gives them uh, uh, many giftings, it's not because God loves them any more than anyone else. In fact, if anything, God says, I expect more. If I have entrusted you with much faith, then much will be expected from you. I once heard someone talk to a pastor saying, I, I want to pray for more giftings, I want to pray for more faith. And the pastor said, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Just be happy where you are. Because if God gives you what you ask for, more is going to be expected. The Bible says that for those of us who teach, a greater judgment awaits us. Myself, Matt, Ian, and men like us will have to stand before the throne of God and be held to account for every single word we have ever taught the people of God. And I don't know about you, I don't know about Matt and Ian, I'm, I'm guessing they probably feel the same. That's a terrifying concept and a humbling concept as well. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of the other. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul basically builds on this and he talks about, can the eye say to the mouth, I have no need of you? Can the hand say to the foot, I have no need of you? I personally love this teaching from Paul. I love all the teachings from Paul, but this specific one speaks a great deal into the practical application of what a church is. A church is and has never meant to be about one man up the front. The church has never, ever meant to be a one-man show. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a gifting of pastoral care in the same way that there is a gifting of teaching. And there are men, according to the book of 1 Timothy, who are called to be under shepherds to shepherds God's people under the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are men who have been gifted to teach the word of God. These are all biblical truths. That's fine. But something goes dangerously wrong when the only gift in the church being used is coming from the pastor and the teacher. I have a lovely encouragement for all of you who are indeed born again, spirit-filled Christians here today every single one of you has been gifted to contribute to the needs of this church. You do not need to be at this pulpit to be gifted in building the body of Christ in Maidstone, in seeking first the kingdom of God and seeing God's kingdom come on this earth. This is a gifting that every single one of you have been given in different ways. Look what Paul says. For as in one body we have many members, but look at what he says next, and the members do not all have the same function. We're not all called to be prophets, we're not all called to te be teachers, but we are all called to be gifted by God for the sake of the body, for the sake of the kingdom. All the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of it. I love this teaching from Paul. We are one communally, and that is true, but we are also individuals who make up the church. The church is no longer, the church stopped being about bricks and mortar, the temple stopped being about the building 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ resurrected. He said, in three days, 
I will destroy this temple and rebuild it again. And they looked at the big temple and they thought, three days? It took thousands of years, thousands, hundreds of years for this to be built to the perfection in which it is now. How are you going to rebuild it in three days? Because Jesus was talking about the living temple. Do you know the Bible says that Christians are living stones being built up together to make the temple of God? in whom the presence of God now dwells. Inside your living bodies, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell, once having been purified and cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is who we are. And every single living stone in the temple, every single part of the church of God, have a part to play. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the members who have more subtle giftings. Their giftings may never mean they're in a pulpit in front of everyone. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 says, the members with the more subtle giftings, the members with the giftings that may never be seen, they are the members that have greater honour. Jesus said the least of you will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. I once heard someone say, you know, I think Billy Graham is going to be right up there, number one at the reward seat, the beamer seat of Christ. I reckon Billy Graham, I reckon Chuck Smith, I reckon the pastors, they'll all be first. And I thought to myself, I guarantee that the first person to receive their reward from Christ, none of you will recognise. You won't have a clue who they are. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Billy Graham was right at the back. It's the lady who served the church faithfully for 50 years and was never, no one even knew the service that she did. Maybe it was completely behind the scenes. The treasurer, who all he deals is making sure the financial situation of the church. The Sunday school teacher, who every single Sunday disappears from the service just to invest in the lives of children, hoping that one day that seed will transform into salvation. The person who serves teas and coffees, the person who comes early and sets up the church, all of these are giftings from God. All of these will receive a reward. God is no man's debtor. He sees the actions of the smallest to the largest, and he shows no partiality in between. It's a beautiful thing to realise. It's a humbling thing for us who do speak publicly, and it's an encouraging thing for those of you who feel that your gifting is more subtly seen. But just know this, that in any way that you serve this church, whether it's seen or unseen, know this, God sees all. God sees all. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Once again, this is about the undeserved favour that is upon our lives and it's given to us, it's assigned to us. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, what that basically means is don't go beyond what God has shown you. Don't try and move in the gift of prophecy beyond the faith that God has given you, beyond the message that God has given you. Don't over-exaggerate, don't lie, don't be dramatic, don't try and muster up something in your imagination. In faith, trust in the prophetic message that the Lord has given you. And prophecy doesn't always mean telling of the future, by the way. Prophecy can also be speaking of words or words from the Bible. Prophecy does not always mean foretelling of the future. In service, in our serving, if we're going to serve, let us serve dutifully, cheerfully. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, ex exhortation would be like encouragement and the teaching of the word as well, bringing out the Bible and speaking it into people's lives. The one who contributes in generosity, God says he loves a cheerful giver. And the one who leads with zeal, if the person's leading the people of God, let him not do so in a slothful manner. Let him not do so lazy. Let him do so zealously. And the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Don't show mercy to others begrudgingly. Don't show mercy out of compulsion. Show mercy cheerfully. Now, Paul does not name all of the gifts, by the way, here. There are other passages where he talks about words of knowledge, words of wisdom, where he talks about healing, he talks about the gift of the interpretation of tongues. There are many other gifts, administration, helping, all of these sorts of things Paul mentions in other letters. He simply is choosing a selection here for the example he's giving of being a living sacrifice. 
First Peter 4 has summed it up in a similar way. The Apostle Peter likened it to the Apostle Paul in terms of the two teaching from the same handbook. Really, he says in First Peter 4, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Notice, the gifts of God that are given to you are not self-serving. The gifts of God are not self-serving. How do you know that something's a gift from God? It will always be outward serving. It's about serving others around you, not yourself. The only gift, the closest gift given by God that is self-serving is the gift of tongues. Paul himself says, if you do not have an interpretation, then the only person blessed is you. And he doesn't say you can't speak in tongues. He simply says, I would rather speak five words in plain language than 10,000 in tongues unless I have an interpretation. Why? Because the interpretation then blesses others. All the gifts are for the building up of the body. 1 Peter 4, as good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The purpose of God's gifting is to serve others and glorify God in heaven. If you ever see a man who professes to be gifted and it only glorifies himself, then he has nothing more than a man-made charisma. God's gift are made to serve others and to glorify God. Let's carry on verse 9 to the end of verse 13. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. I've nicknamed this passage, verse, verse 9 to verse 21, the Proverbs of Paul because he now seems to give a very proverb-like instruction to the church, one thing to the next to the next, without really pausing for breath. The Proverbs of Paul here. And he starts by saying this, let love be genuine. Now you have to ask yourself, why does he even need to say that? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's because much of the time, love isn't genuine. It's very easy for me to say to you, I love you. It's easy, I just did. Look how easy that was, I'll say it again, I love you. Really easy. It's much harder to show you that I love you, to go out of my way to love you, to place you in a position in my life where my love is actually applied to you. That's is genuine love. The word love here is the word agape. It is the divine love. Out of the four different Greek words for love, agape is the love that comes from above. It's the sacrificial love, the same word used to describe the love that God has for us. The word agape is the love that places another person above yourself. Let your love for each other be genuine. In 1 John, this genuine love is one of the examples of salvation. John in 1 John tells us that one of the key evidences of someone actually being saved is that they will love their brothers and sisters. He goes as far to say that if you do not love your brother or sister, you have never seen Jesus nor known him. How can you say you know Jesus, the source of all love, love himself, if you don't love each other? Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. That word abhor, it means quite literally to be disgusted by what is evil, to hate what is evil. Now, let's just clarify something. I'm not here saying at all to find people disgusting or to hate people people. 
We are not called to judge the world and we are called to love all people. What I'm saying is we are to abhor sometimes what they do. Even the own sin that is shown in our lives. To find it disgusting, to hate it. And it might shock you to know that God does indeed hate some things. You think, no, God can't hate anything. God's love. No, 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 no. Proverbs tells us God hates a lying tongue. God hates pride. God hates a false witness. God hates a brother who brings about division. And there's some others as well. So understand that God does indeed hate what is evil and loves what is good. In the same way that earlier I talked about the renewing of your mind, abhorring evil is something that we need to continually keep in check. The world will do everything it can to sear your conscience, to make it that sin and evil to you becomes more acceptable. And the world is clever and subtle about how it does this. It does it in advertisement. What do I mean by that? A man is driving to work every single day and he drives past this same billboard every single day with a half-naked woman on it. Every single day he drives to work and every single day this same billboard has this half-naked woman on it. The man is married, the man has a family at home, the Bible says that's immodest, the Bible says it's sexually impure, the Bible says that God would hate that image being there, leading so many to temptation on their way to work. But as he sees it day in and day out, day in and day out, the image of another woman aside from his wife being half naked begins to sear his conscience. It doesn't mean too much anymore. So that next time he sees an advert or a film or something like this with on it, it's, it's no big deal. Over time, he has stopped abhorring what is evil and his conscience has been seared. We can do that example with many things. Take a violent war movie. Watch violent movies constantly. You see arms blown off and legs blown off. And so when we see these things happening in the real world, our consciences are seared. It's like, yeah, okay, well, I played that on PlayStation a couple of weeks ago. That doesn't really bother me too much. The world is very subtle in how it will sear your conscience as a Christian. So how do we combat this? The same thing Paul said at the beginning. Renew your mind by the word of God. Let the word of God define your feelings, define how you view the world and what happens in the world. Abhor what is evil. And I love what he says next. Hold fast to what is good. That word hold fast is an action. It's an action given to sailors when the storm is coming in or when the arrows and the guns are being fired. They would scream out to the sailors, hold fast. Everyone grab a weapon, grab the rigging, get ready, stand firm. And Paul tells us we need to hold fast to what is good. Why? Because we will be continually tempted to let go. Continually tempted to have our consciences seared. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Brotherly affection simply speaks into that family bond that we now have. I have not met many of you, but if Lord Jesus Christ is indeed your saviour, as he is indeed mine, we are indeed family. In fact, I haven't met many of you, but the family I've been raised with since birth, if they do not give their lives to Jesus, I'm going to spend eternity with you and not them. I want them to give their lives to Jesus. But the point is, we might as well start getting to know each other now. We're going to be around each other for an awfully long time. I don't know if there's a maidstone in heaven, but I'll certainly be visiting once every thousand years or something like that. <laughs> Maybe once, not every thousand years, but you know what I mean. We're going to spend eternity together. So why do we start loving each other as a family there? Let's start loving each other as a family now. So that when we get to heaven, we haven't got to try and work out who everyone is. And I love what it says next. Outdo one another in showing honour. The word honour here is placing someone else above yourself. When you honour someone, it's placing them above yourself. And I love what Paul says. Outdo one another. 
have a church competition who can honor each other the most imagine what sunday would be like if every person came to church thinking i'm going to be the one who honors everyone the most today i'm going to be the one who loves everyone the most today. i'm going to really sacrificially love these guys as much as i can today imagine if every single christian had that attitude my goodness what a church it would be outdo one another in showing honor do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord rejoice in hope be patient in tribulation be constant in prayer and contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality he starts by saying all three are linked do not be slothful in zeal but be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Let your number one passion in this world be the kingdom of God and seeing it grow. Let your number one passion in this world be the word of God, be the Lord who sits upon the throne. Let that be your number one passion. Let it not just be your hobby, let it be your everything. Your everything. Anyone here like football? Hands up. Anyone here been to a football match? Hands up. You know when your team scores a goal? What do the thousands of people in the arenas do? Scream, shout, celebrate. Parties on the streets if you win the championship or whatever it is. I do not know football. But the point is, look at the zeal. Look at the fervence football supporters have. Sometimes you can go to some churches and you'll find more zeal and fervence in the football stadiums than you will in the children of God whose Saviour has died on a cross for their sins. How on earth does that make sense? Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. The footballers should be coming to the church saying, wow, these guys love Jesus. What must have Jesus have done for them for them to love him so? Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Once again, all three of these are linked. Rejoice in the hope that we have, that one, we are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, and two, God's hand is over our life no matter where we go. And then be patient in tribulation. It is a guarantee that every single Christian will face tribulation, not the tribulation okay i'm not going to get into a rapture thing right here today that really is too heavy for my first time at maidstone but what i'm saying is some tribulation jesus said if you follow me you will indeed have tribulation be patient in tribulation and then what's the response to tribulation be constant in prayer be constant in prayer now if you're thinking in your head does that mean I have to kind of stay on my knees, eyes closed, hands together 24 hours a day? How does that work? To be constant in prayer is to be prayerfully constant in your perspectives about everything. From the smallest to the largest. From finding a car parking space, to doing your groceries, to encountering worldwide persecution. Be constant in prayer. Prayer is a conversation between you and the Lord and you are able to have that conversation wherever you are whenever you are at any time there are prayers in the Bible where someone has not even opened their mouth and it says they pray in their hearts there are prayers in the Bible where someone's been moving their mouth and no sound has come out but God has heard it as if they were and there are prayers in the Bible of people on their knees and there's prayers in the Bible of people standing up there's prayers with people's eyes closed and there's Jesus looking to heaven and praying prayer is conversation with God reverent conversation definitely reverent conversation we are addressing God Almighty the King of Kings our Lord and our Savior but it is something God tells us to do constantly Philippians chapter 4 do not be anxious about anything but in everything but in everything through prayer and supplication with Thanksgiving let your requests be known to God pray at all times there's nothing wrong with giving glory to god because you've just found a car park space there's nothing wrong with it give glory to god for everything everything wake up and thank him for the oxygen that you can even then pray in the morning 
Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, and contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Contribute to the needs of the saints. In the Bible, it does give a specific exhortation to how we are meant to treat the household of God. In Galatians 6.10, it says, As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Do good to everyone, but especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. One pastor put it like this, Do you come to church to be served, or do you come to church to be of service? Do you come to the table of God simply looking to be fed? Or do you bring anything to the table? Do you help set up the table? Or are you just there with your knife and your fork and your handkerchief just ready to eat? Every single Christian should come to church every single Sunday and Monday to Saturday, because church is wherever we are, with a desire to serve the body of Christ. So I don't know this, and Matt has not spoken to me, and Ian has not spoken to me, and so this is not some setup. But let me ask you a question. If you are not serving in Maidstone Calvary Chapel in any way, shape, or form, why? Why? I'm sure if you asked, there would be many things you could help with. Come to church with the desire to serve the body and not just be served by it. It's a very different perspective around church if you come like that. Now, before we continue and finish with Romans chapter 12, I just want to point out one thing. All of what Paul has mentioned so far requires real sacrifice. You can go back through the list of Romans chapter 12 and every single point he raises requires sacrifice of the person applying it to their life. Whether it be a sacrifice of pride, a sacrifice of self-serving, a sacrifice of the flesh temptations we have, a sacrifice is needed for every single attribute that Paul gives for us to do. Because the second you start placing other people as more important than yourself, you are literally sacrificing yourself in that moment. You're choosing for someone else to be the important one. You're choosing for the world not to revolve around you, but to revolve around the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore revolve around his people as well. Paul finishes and carries on as we make our way to the end. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Jesus taught the church, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other and offer them the other cheek. I won't ask how many of us think they could possibly do that. It would have to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. When I think about someone slapping one of my cheeks, I just, Lord, help me. Help me every second of the day. It has to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord says, for those who persecute you, for those who curse you, bless them. Pray for them. Love them. Do the same for them that Jesus did for you. Do the same for them that Jesus did for you. For you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Once again, it's about being a family and live in harmony with one another. Unity is a powerful tool within the church of God. If you want to find out in life something that God holds in very high regard and loves, and something that Satan absolutely hates, do a simple mathematical equation. How much does Satan attack it? God loves marriage. Satan hates it. 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 
You only need to look at how attacked something is to realise how much the devil hates it and how much God loves it. I took the example of marriage, now take the example of church unity. Ever since the founding of the church in the early church apostolic age, division has been the biggest danger to the church. The biggest single danger to the church is division. Jesus himself said, a kingdom divided cannot stand. How can a church represent a God who is one if we are separate? It makes no sense. It goes even further than this, by the way. It goes even into our evangelism. We were talking about evangelism earlier. Look at what John 13 says. This is what Jesus taught. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus teaches, by this they will know that you belong to me if you have love for one another. Love and unity is the greatest of evang evangelical tools in our arsenal. It shows the world something different is here. The love of God is here. The love for each other is here in a way that the world can never know. That is how they will know that you are my people. I implore you, Maidstone Calvary Chapel, protect unity at all costs. And sometimes in order to protect unity, it will mean you honouring someone above yourself. You decreasing that Christ can increase in the place. It might mean that you don't get all of your opinions across. It might mean that not everyone agrees with you. And it might mean that you don't go your way. But for the sake of unity, you lay yourself aside and accept loving one another instead. This is where humility comes in. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honourable in the sight of all, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Live peaceably with all. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, and never be wise in your own sight. Jesus, when he came in the flesh, he used to eat with prostitutes, eat with tax collectors eat with what the Pharisees considered the scum of the world and he would eat with them and share the gospel with them and when they said to him how could you possibly share a meal with these people he said I have not come for those who think they're righteous I've come for those who know that they are sick I have come to heal the blind and to save the lost and to heal the deaf for those who need me now by the way that's not to say that he was eating with the prostitutes and eating with the tax collectors and simply accepting what they were doing. That isn't the case. Jesus was telling them the truth while eating with them and dining with them. He was correcting them and leading them to repentance while eating and dining with them. It wasn't a, I accept everything that's going on. No, he was telling the truth in the midst of them. Repay no one evil, sorry I missed one, I nearly missed one, an important one. Never be wise in your own sight, which goes back to once again having a moderate estimate of yourself. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honourable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. I, I, I love this bit. If possible, so far as it depends on you you. Paul here is not naive to the fact there are going to be people who just don't like you. And there's going to be people who want to persecute you because you're a Christian. That's, he's not naive to the fact we can't get along with everyone. And he doesn't expect us to either. The Bible is very much against people pleasing. But what Paul says is, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Let your actions be honourable. Let your perspectives be right. Let your words be seasoned with love. Yet let your reactions be defined by the Bible. As long as it depends on you, live peaceably with all.
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Possibly finishing in Romans 12 with one of the most sacrificial elements of being a living sacrifice is to lay aside our pride and our desire to defend ourselves and to entrust it to God Almighty. In the book of Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk cried out to God and said, God, why is there no justice? The evil seem to succeed, the false prophets seem to prosper, the innocent are dying, the innocent suffer, I myself am tormented. God, where is the justice? What are you doing up there? Where are you? And I love God's response to Habakkuk. Son, don't worry, a day is coming when I will hold every single careless word every single sinful action to account. There is not one sin done unless taken by the Lord Jesus Christ that will ever go unaddressed and unpunished. You see, with sin, you have two choices. Either the sinner can take the punishment or Christ can. Jesus died on the cross and he says to you, let me take it. But if you choose to reject Jesus, the only person left to take it is you. There will always be a judgment for sin, either on the cross or upon the sinner, dependent on which one the person chooses. But here Paul says, do not avenge yourself. When wrong is done to you, leave it in the hands of God. Do not seek recompense. Do not seek to be justified in a worldly way. Leave it in the hands of God and trust in your Saviour to bring about justice in the situation, whether in this world or the next. And he then goes one step further. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, giving something to drink for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good the most sacrificial thing we can do as christians aside from laying down our own lives for the lord jesus christ is to do exactly what paul is talking about here to feed those who persecute us, to give water to those who hate us, to pray for those who are our enemies, and to bless those who curse us. There is quite literally nothing more Christ-like you can do in this world. Do you remember what I said at the beginning? That God loved us while we were still his enemies? To love your enemies in a Christ-like way is as close to the character of Jesus as you can possibly get. Because he done the same thing for every single one of us. Basically, you could wrap Romans chapter 12 up like this. I should have just started with this and finished with this. It would have saved us a lot of time. You could wrap it up like this. Love each other. Love and treat others exactly as Jesus Christ has loved and treated you. Really, you can sum the whole entire chapter up in that way. And all of it, just like the life of Jesus, requires sacrifice. Let me finish, and I really will finish with this. My congregation always laugh when I say let me finish because it usually means there's another 20 minutes to go. But with this, I actually am going to finish. Philippians chapter 2, this really sums up, I think, Romans 12. In Philippians 2, it says this. I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Listen to this next bit. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul writes to the Philippians, to the Corinthians, to the Romans with one message, be like Christ. That is who, that is the pinnacle example of a living sacrifice and we are called now to continue that role of being living sacrifices so with that let's pray and ask the lord to help us in this impossible task without the god who makes all things possible let's pray heavenly father we testify to exactly that that these things are indeed impossible for us without the empowering and anointing of your Holy Spirit. That we need, Lord, you to help us, shape us, guide us, empower us, convict us and encourage us to do these things. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the ultimate living sacrifice, that he humbled himself, not counting equality with you, something to be hung on to but counting our salvation more, placing us above himself and dying for our sins. And now, Heavenly Father, he is ex exalted above all and everyone, that by his name every knee should bow. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may stand by, by each other and before you by the grace afforded to us by his sacrifice, washed clean by his blood, filled with your Holy Spirit, born again and made anew. We ask now, Lord, that in our day-to-day -day lives, you would please help us to be those living sacrifices you ask us to be. And may, Lord, it not start tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday. Lord, may it start right now. Please help us, Lord, that you may be glorified, your kingdom may come on this world, and many souls may be added before it is all said and done. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.